Okay, it is 2.44 by my watch, and the next session is going to be about Coach Dean Smith, and as you all know, he believed that if you don't start early, you're late. So, this is a topic on which no one has an opinion. The few people who have opinions don't hold them very strongly. I uh, had the pleasure of serving for a number of years on the Knight Commission on Intercollegiate Athletics, and almost without fail at each meeting, Father Hesburgh would say, well, Doug, tell us what all the alumni think. I said, I'll do that, Father Ted, after you tell me what all the faculty think. I said, oh, they don't all think alike. So, um, we believe all of you know how to read, so I'm not going to introduce any of our panelists because you have their backgrounds in front of you. You have um, nameplates that you can see, I'm confident. And so we're going to move right through this so that we can also get to your questions. The first question goes to Provost James Dean. In what ways are student athletes like other students? In what ways are they different? And what are the implications for these similarities and differences for their academic careers? Well, thanks, Doug. And first, I want to verify those in the back can hear me OK? A little louder. Louder. OK, how about now? All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so the question was about how student athletes are, are alike are, are like, or different from uh, all other students. And so I'm going to start with how they're alike and then move to how they're different. So all students that we have here, whether athletes or non-athletes, are alike in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, I think it's really important to understand that all students here, athlete or non-athlete, have earned a spot as a student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, just as you did when you came here. Secondly, they all have academic potential and academic interests that should be respected and encouraged. Third, all students devote time to what they're passionate about, all students. Some students are passionate about opera. I just saw a student opera performance last week, very impressive. Some are passionate about programming. Some are passionate about hacking, but that's another story. <laughs> some of them are passionate about writing for the Daily Tar Heel, and some of them are passionate about playing a sport. And one other thing that all students have in, in common, whether they're athletes or not, is that the vast majority of their adult lives will not be spent playing professional sports. All students have that in common. Student athletes are in, different from other students in some ways. Uh, first of all, and I think that this maybe has not gotten enough attention in the dialogue about college sports, they have achieved a lifelong dream of playing big time college sports a lifelong dream that they've achieved, which I'm sure a lot of other people would love to be in that position, but they are. Secondly, they have to organize their academic lives around the constraints of what is essentially a full-time job that comes with that dream. And third, they receive considerable assistance in charting their academic course, which in fairness is actually similar to other groups of students as well, so maybe not such a big difference. A very small number of student athletes certainly less than 5%, and I believe considerably smaller, have the opportunity to earn life-changing money in professional sports. But even there, tenures are generally short, and many professional athletes do not emerge from the experience set for life financially. So what does all this mean? Whether a student is a non-athlete, an athlete, or a potential professional athlete, we owe them, and at UNC Chapel Hill, we try to provide them the opportunity to flourish as a student and as a person, and to enjoy all of the advantages that a world-class institution like UNC Chapel Hill offers, which as everyone in this room knows, goes far beyond economic benefits and changes lives in much deeper ways. Thank you. Bubba, much, much has been written about the health and safety of student athletes in recent years. What services are provided to student athletes and how has it changed over the years? Thanks, Doug. My apologies for uh, being late. One thing they don't provide is a, a watch. So, <laughs> no, actually, I was out at uh, tennis, and uh, men's tennis really got started late. The uh, Denver-Mississippi State match went really late, so I was trying to stay for the very last second. I missed it by 30 seconds, so my apologies. Um, I think one thing that uh, 
and as part of that question, are the this health services we provide to student athletes I'm kind of lost in the national conversation of what's happening and taking advantage of student athletes and health care long term is the incredible health care that is provided to student athletes while they participate in intercollegiate athletics. And I think that the North Carolina model is something that's been in place from the early 80s when we had the unfortunate uh, situation of a student athlete dying on the practice field. And our medical model that we use at Carolina is something that is now replicated across the country and used as an example. In fact, the first and only medical director in the history of the NCAA, Dr. Brian Hainline, was here about uh, three weeks ago, and he talked about the program that we have in place for our student athletes. And it, it was an exemplar that he used and uses with his discussion across the country. But in addition to great health care while they're participating in sport, and that generally relates to your athletic trainers and the orthopedic physicians and folks like that, we now have two nutritionists full-time on staff. We have a dietitian uh, at the university. We also have um, a sports psychologist. We have psychiatrists. We have more medical assistance, not only for the physical health and well-being, but for the mental health and well-being. And I think also that's going to begin to relate to career counseling and transition from life as an athlete when many of the, much of the focus of the young person's life has been participation in their sport and at some point in their life, their ability to participate at the highest level will be done and they need to transition into a career that is both beneficial and profitable for themselves and for their family. And I think you're seeing more and more of that. So I think the health care of student athletes is the best it's ever been. We also have incredible insurance programs for current student athletes, and if we have any catastrophic injuries for student athletes, we cover them post-participation as well. So I think that some of what you're reading about may be a little bit uh, off base because the health care is outstanding. Lisa, should we explore freshman ineligibility, and how will changes in the NCAA initial eligibility standards that begin in 2016 impact this? Well, that's a great question, and actually Jim here at the end, Jim Delaney and the Big Ten have really um, started the dialogue on that with the publication of a document called Education <clears throat> First, Athletics Second. So as you probably know, since 1972, freshmen have been permitted to compete, uh, prior to that, they were not. They were ineligible. And there is some suggestion in the Big Ten document that we ought to explore returning to that model, at least for the sports of football and men's basketball. Um, so again, uh, thinking about that, um, one impetus for that might be the prevalence of one and dones in men's basketball and a desire to get out of that business. And when you look at the data with respect to one and dones, it is really quite surprising. In recent years, there have really been, I think, on average, something like 10 student athletes who have left for the professional ranks after their freshman year. So f that's a very small number in the grand scheme of things, and that in and of itself, in my opinion at least, would not be a reason to consider uh, freshman ineligibility. Further, uh, the data that the NCAA has collected with respect to academic performance of student athletes who do redshirt uh, versus student athletes who do not does not show any very great difference between their first year academic performance in college. And in uh, football in particular, uh, a high number of freshman student athletes do redshirt, uh, really for physical reasons, obviously. Um, and a, a fair number, although lesser number, in men's basketball redshirt as well. So there is a robust data pool out there to look at the academic performance of those who do redshirt vis-a-vis -vis those who do not, and uh, there is not a dramatic increase in performance for those students who have redshirted. Um, so uh, the f a year from now, in the fall of 2016, the NCAA is increasing their initial eligibility standards to compete in college. And student athletes who have not achieved a 2.3 GPA in their high school core GPA courses as defined by the NCAA will not be eligible to compete in their freshman year. And that is going to be referred to as an academic red shirt. So in my mind, that is the appropriate way to proceed with respect to redshirting. If we're concerned about academic performance, let's identify those students who we are predicting on the front end are going to have the most difficulty in competing academically at the college level 
and give them a break from competing athletically at the college level that first year. They'll still have four years of eligibility to compete after that, assuming that they have been able to keep their academic house in order that first year. Now, uh, there might be additional reasons after we see how that plays out to continue this conversation about uh, ineligibility for all freshmen, but at this point, I at least think uh, that's overkill. Now, maybe this conversation will lead the NBA to modifying, and then the NBA Players Association to modifying their rules so that uh, they can take students who are interested and talented enough to pursue professional sports um, right out of high school instead of requiring them uh, to be 19 years of age. So to the extent that we can uh, start this conversation and change that rule, I'm all for it. But for right now, I'm willing to um, wait and see how our new initial eligibility standards play out. Joy, from the perspective of students, faculty, administrators, coaches, and alumni, how varied are the definitions of risk, opportunity, ability, and exploitation related to our student athletes? Well, you started the conversation with saying there's probably this many number of opinions about athletics, and that's what I've found over the last three years of, of chairing the athletics committee is, is really listening to the varied pers perspectives that come to the committee, and everyone feels very passionate about their perspective, and everyone feels they're right um, in what they've decided. Um, so it's negotiating that for the last three years has been a little bit difficult. So in my world, I come out of healthcare and a science background, so everything's an equation and a formula, and we think we come up with the right answers at the end. And so for me, you look at opportunity, and you take away or subtract the risk, and you look at what you have there. But that's not the end of it. You have to temper that with what's the true ability of the individuals involved, as well as what's the exploitation factor that's there. So if you ask any different groups of people, whether it be students, faculty, alumni, et cetera, what does opportunity mean? Um, well, there's, you know, for the students, it's an opportunity for an education. It's an opportunity to play in big time sports and have that um, new place to showcase their activities. For coaches, it's an opportunity to have a top season, to have a championship. For the administrators, it's an opportunity to expand the brand. It's an opportunity to market the university, again, in a wider, bigger stage, to attract very high quality students, both athletes and non-athletes. And for faculty, I have to tell you, we think it's a double-edged sword, okay? The opportunities there for engaging more alumni and future donors through the aspects and the great amount of marketing that goes on with the university related to sporting events, but faculty always add the but. Um, that goes along with that. Um, a lot of faculty recognize we have high caliber students here on this campus who are non-athletes who came here because of the sports program. Our student body president who's graduating tomorrow said he got admitted to every school he applied to, many of the Ivies, many of the top schools in the country, and he came here because he liked Carolina football and Carolina basketball. Okay? He knew he could be successful and he could get a good education in any of those in institutions that he applied, but he wanted that added collegiate experience. He wanted to be at an institution that had big time sports. And I think our administrators realize the added value to the student body, to the student culture that happens on campus, as well as those of us who have left the university many decades ago um, as alumni, and we still feel a connection, and much of that connection is sometimes through the sporting events. So it's, it's a wide range, and alumni, you see it, Right, you like having the institution out there and being a common name. Holden Thorpe said that he, he knew Carolina was everywhere when he was staying on the edge of one of the Galapag Galapagos Islands and the person next to him had a Carolina hat on. And he was like, okay, <laughs> they're everywhere. And, and you enjoy that, we all do. It gives name recognition to your diploma and et cetera. So, so we like that opportunity. We like that ability to be a high um, profile program. But then with it comes some risks. And you know, on the front end of this equation, opportunity is what we like to talk about because that's sort of the win side and positive side. But then we get to risk, sometimes not talked about as much because we're afraid it might lead us to making a decision that we don't really want to make. But it's really being true to that. And for our students, it's our student athletes, it's looking at potential for injury, them questioning if they've made the right decisions, those sorts of risks of what ifs that play there. And those what ifs can be very frightening for a 17, 18, 19 year old coming in. For our coaches, it's unrealized expectations. 
They may have built in too much into that. For administrators, the same thing is unrealized expectations of this opportunity that was given to them, but also the administrators have to deal with the unintended outcomes if we didn't think ahead and really mitigate the risk that was there. For faculty, it's questioning the proper use of resources. It's looking at, if, are they the ones expected to mitigate the risk when it comes to student academics? Um, that's gonna require more effort on their part. And for our alumni, you're afraid it's gonna tarnish the name. That's probably one of the biggest risks that you see. You want us to do it well, but you want us to do it right. So it's a big, big piece there. Ability is a little harder to get your handle on because most people equate ability um, with performance, and those are not always the same. Our students come to us from a wide variety of backgrounds that are going to play a role in how well they can take their ability and put it into performance. And big conversations on this campus are what, how do we measure performance? It's by success. And I think we would have as many varied opinions about what success is in this room as we do about college, at, college sports. We have some faculty that think every student here should be graduating with a 3.0. We think some students say the minimum you can graduate here with is a 2.0, and for some of our students on this campus, that is a success. And that's something that no one in their family has ever done before, has walked away with, from college with a degree. So it's not just the student athlete um, group of our students where this conversation is happening, but it's how all of us like to say what success and describe discuss. Exploitation, all of us own it. There's potential for all of us to play a role in exploitation. Our students can use the college stage to present themselves individually and, and look really at what they want to do. Um, obviously, coaches are going to look at it as a way to get the win, get the championship, have a top program. Administrators want to use that high visibility program again to bring uh, and expand the brand. Um, faculty also use those opportunities sometimes to support a particular point of view. Um, so I think all of us need to have a watchful eye for exploitation, but sometimes that eye needs to be looking in the mirror, and we're playing a part of that exploitation along the way. Jim Delaney, college athletics has provided many educational and athletic opportunities over the decades. What are some strategies to ensure ourselves that opportunities are pr preserved and enhanced and exploitation of underprepared students is avoided? You know, I think that's really the nub of it. Um, on one hand, you have the opportunity. On the other hand, you have the risk, as was described. And it's making sure that you do the best job you can to get the right fit. So NCAA eligibility rules um, are rules not of admission, and they don't define success. Um, they are rules that are intended to apply to 350 universities playing in 32 conferences uh, across the country. And we all know among those 351 universities, there are various kinds of universities. There are open admission universities. There are elite public and private selective institutions. There are plenty of um, you know, flavors. Uh, the problem is that the eligibility rules are set at such a level to define what is an NCAA eligible male or female student athlete. And those rules apply to football players and to basketball players, and they apply to soccer players and tennis players. And you know they have made efforts over time to um, test them, to determine how effective they are. The problem is, because someone is NCAA eligible, doesn't mean that they're going to be a great fit at all 351 universities. And it's simply because as athletics is competitive on a particular campus for playing time, so are students competitive in their ability to compete in the classroom at any particular university. And so my concern with the NCAA eligibility rules is that they're used at selective and non-selective universities in about the same way. And while most of these individuals that play sports are admitted individually. There's tremendous pressure to admit a student who is, other, who is NCAA eligible. It doesn't guarantee or assure anything. And so why is it then that when you look at graduation rates for football and basketball among the 38 teams that play Division I athletes, they rank 37th and 38th, dead last 
in their graduation um, rate. And it's simply because the pressure to admit and the focus sometimes on athletics or maybe even the dream or nightmare of professional sports inhibits a focus on education. And especially at elite universities, the gap between the, the NCAA eligible student athlete and the student body, especially in football and basketball, is a significant gap. Sometimes more than one standard deviation, sometimes more than two standard deviations, and sometimes more than three standard deviations. So when you put that individual in a class with very well-prepared students and you don't provide at the institution a normal course of remediation, that student is going to struggle. It's not to say they can't succeed. It's not to say that they can't take advantage of the opportunity. But the potential is there for having a very significant gap between that individual and the student body in general. So while freshman ineligibility is, is a subject that, that stimulates a lot of discussion and dialogue, and it may not be the silver bullet, although I do know a coach who coached here for many years who thought it was a very effective way to make sure that people understood that education was one and athletics were two, it doesn't have a, a lot of momentum, but we've raised it to talk about if not, if not freshman ineligibility, then what? What about the time demands? What about remediation? What about strengthened initial eligibility? Because the, the results in these two sports is very different from the, from the um, same standards apply to all other sports. The performance in these two sports is 37th and 38th out of 38. And the gap between 36 and 37 is larger than the gap between 36 and 25. So I'm all in favor of better standards and opportunity, but I think we've got to, uh, I think the burden on us is to show that the people who are being admitted have the potential to succeed with their classmates, and in particular, for the most selective public and private institutions in the country, it, re it requires um, patience and I think thoroughness and looking in the mirror so that we don't mismatch the student athlete who is NCA eligible with a student body where that uh, ability to compete is, is uh, more risky than it would otherwise be. Will, would one year away from competition for all students in all sports make sense? It might be. It's, it's the way the world was from the 1890s to the 1970s. We went away from it for um, financial reasons. And um, I, I don't think it served us particularly well. And I think the outcomes are clear. Uh, the challenge is clear. Uh, the solutions are not so clear. But I would simply say that for any s university that, that aspires to be at the very top of the competitive um, pyramid and also aspires to have students who fit well uh, into the university, that there's a, a challenge and there's a tension there. And uh, I think it's well worth a lot of our time to think about whether or not this is an approach that could be applied to all or to sports or selected individuals because I think the results of what we have in these two sports is not something that engenders a lot of co uh, confidence uh, in, a lot, in a lot of people at this time. So we're going to head back this direction. So Jim, you get another question. What might be the competitive consequences of this opportunity to exploitation dilemma at highly selective universities such as Carolina and others? Well, I think it's a challenge. Uh, I really do. I think it's, uh, if you look around the country, there, are, there aren't 100 UNCs. Um, there are not 100 Harvard and Yales. There are not 100 Davidsons. And um, the great thing about American higher education, it's diversity the opportunities that it offers, but not every student who is NC eligible fits at every institution. And so, you know, I, I think that over time, and it's a recommendation that the Rawlings um, panel made to North Carolina a while ago, is, is really to engage in very serious conversation with similarly situated institutions, whether it's Berkeley or whether it's Stanford or whether it's Michigan. Um, and to think about these initial eligibility rules. What are the strategies? I know that there aren't many students here where there's a robust remediation program. People are assumed to be able to come in 
and compete with their cohort. And if there's not a robust remediation program and there's not freshman ineligibility, and if those individuals cannot sustain an academic effort and one on the field, I think it creates real problems. And I think that you'll see over time that the most selective institutions in the country do most poorly when the NCA eligibility standards are the most modest because they in fact become um, de facto admissions uh, processes. They play a huge role because there's pressure on the athletic establishment to say, well, this person is eligible at University X. They need to be eligible at University Y when X and Y have different kinds of student bodies. So it's a real challenge. It's a real tension. And uh, I think you have to pay careful attention. I know that each student here that is admitted goes through an individual process. But I'm not sure that NCAA test scores and high school GPA is always the best way of predicting um, success in a highly competitive environment. The student bodies at North Carolina and at Michigan and UCLA and at Texas and Florida are much better than they were 40 or 50 years ago. And yet I'm not sure that the athlete who aspires to compete at those institutions is necessarily better prepared than the athletes that were competing 20 or 30 years ago. So it's a gap issue. And it's particularly difficult at elite, whether public or private selective institutions. And I would say that there's not an easy answer. I, I don't expect that anyone would think that freshman ineligibility is an easy answer. It's expensive. It's probably overly broad, as, uh, as Lisa described. But I do think that we have to make some changes, take some actions that will clearly, for ourselves and for the public, um, indicate that education is more of a priority and athletics is um, behind the uh, the academics. If we're going to prepare these young people, if it's going to be truly an opportunity and a life-changing experience, we have to make sure that the educational part is real, it's substantive, and both for the individual as well as for the people that support the universities. Joy, in today's collegiate <clears throat> In today's collegiate sports environment, what are the faculty roles and responsibilities and the student roles and responsibilities? Well, in my, again, I'm in healthcare and I always said I picked healthcare education. There's not two more political <clears throat> areas, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what to do about healthcare and everybody knows what to do about education. So a few years ago when I was asked if I would run for the faculty athletics committee, I thought, well, that would be a nice breather. Yeah, I would get out of health care and I'd get out of education because I'm really not a political being to, um, as, it, as it comes. But, but one thing that I, that I am and I have been for, for over 36 years is an educator. And there's one thing that hasn't changed about faculty roles uh, and responsibilities, and that has to do with taking a student from where he or she is and helping them get to where they want to go. Now, I will tell you, in teaching for almost four decades, where that student is has changed tremendously, and where that student wants to go has changed tremendously. Um, the skill sets they come with us, the abilities and the dreams are very, very different um, than what I had in students 20 years ago or so. And the same thing's through, it's true for the students, right? Their expectations for college have changed, and what they think we should do for them as faculty may change. They all come from a variety of backgrounds, um, and depending on what has happened with them along the way in their education, that plays a role in what they think they can do. Um, those solutions and issues of bringing that partnership together of student and faculty starts in middle school. Um, one thing I've learned in, in being in this athletics world, even though for just a few years, is this is not a college athletics problem. Um, this is starting in the middle schools, where the parents are pulling the kids out of school and sending them on travel teams and club teams, because they think they'll be seen more and they'll have more of a chance in sports. Um, they'll be seen in collegiate sports um, recruiting. So at the very beginning, when they're starting truly to start thinking about who they might be at the middle school level, someone's already telling them sports is your ticket, not their <coughs> academics. So that's a, a trend that I've seen that I'm thinking could be damaging to the partnership between students and faculty in that role. We're seeing the same thing happen at the high school level. Uh, when I first started looking at admissions and being uh, a part of looking at the whole 
um, way Carolina does their admissions here and how we determine if our students are, are really truly ready to come into this academic environment. As you looked at transcripts, I was puzzled by the freshman sophomore grades would not be very good and then the junior senior grades would be improving. And I'm saying, well, which is the ability? Which is the true ability of that student? And as I talked with colleagues who know a lot more about collegiate sports than I do, they said everything went into their sport, their freshman and sophomore year, because they had to be seen. The college recruiters had to start looking at them, so they put everything into that. Once they got seen and saw they might be a collegiate athlete, then they started working on grades junior and senior year. Well, guess what? Their cohort that knew they were going to college their freshman year in high school, they started preparing for college their freshman year, not their junior year. Some of these kids come from backgrounds that no one knows what college is, what it means to apply, what it means to navigate it. They've never heard of SATs. They've never heard of ACTs. The other cohort in their high school may have been prepping for their SAT since eighth grade. So they're in a different world and they want to become a part of the collegiate world and I personally think we need to help them do that. It is the opportunity side of that equation. So I think faculty still need to take students where they are and help them get to where they want to be. But faculty also need to wake up that it's a new day in a different world and there's a lot of different ways to get those students there. And it's okay if a student wants to excel in sports. That doesn't mean they don't want to do well in academics. It doesn't mean they won't be successful in life. But I also think the students need to own their education. Some of what happened here was this athletes handed over their educational experience to someone else to make decisions for them. And just like we encourage our students when they come here as freshmen, take advantage of the resources but start becoming more and more independent learners. Student athletes need to be doing the same. And I'm very proud of the academic support program we have here at Carolina. Dr. Michelle Brown has done a tremendous job in developing a My Academic Plan for each and every individual student athlete. And it takes them from their freshman year, gives them the support they need, identifies what they need, much what Jim was talking about, where are they, and how do we help them be successful here at Carolina. But part of her plan is to wean them off of academic support. So they become independent learners. They start thinking about their futures and what they want to do. And she's putting together a tremendous team to get those students there. So I've been very, very encouraged at what Carolina is doing, not just on the admissions end, as Jim was saying, but also moving in through and helping them be successful here and making those students who they want to be when they finish, sometimes when they're not even sure who that was when they came in here. Lisa, are the time demands on student athletes related to athletic participation too great? And if so, how can a better balance between athletics and academics be achieved? Well, the time demands are significant. And let's go back to the NCAA rule book for just a moment. The rule book says student athletes are not supposed to spend more than 20 hours per week when they are in season and eight hours per week when they are out of season on so-called CARA, or Countable Athletically Related Activities. And of course, the NCAA rulebook didn't get to be this thick for without a reason. They then define what are countable athletically related activities in very specific ways. So basically, not everything counts, even though the students are spending time on it. So I think, Bubba, recently you gave a, an account that said, uh, for a student who comes here to Keenan Stadium to play football on a Saturday, we know how much time that takes, so you could imagine that they come over by bus, they uh, work out, they dress, there's a lot of hours before the game. The game can last for quite a bit of time, as we all know as spectators in the stand, and then afterwards they have to see seek treatment for physical ailments, shower, and so on. And that whole kit and caboodle counts for what? Three hours? So that counts three hours, but that's basically a whole day's worth of activity. So. Um, when student athletes have been surveyed by the NCAA and others about how much time do you really spend on your athletically related activities, the numbers come back something much closer to 40 hours per week, which we've, we've heard already today. And that is even the case during their out-of-season segments for so-called voluntary workouts that uh, are arranged uh, for their teams. So that's a lot of time for a student athlete to be spending on the athletic component of their, of their day. Now, um, what do we do about it? Or what can we do about it if we think that's too much? Uh, you know, we could shorten seasons 
uh, potentially. We could reduce the number of contests, reduce travel, which has become a particular challenge as our conferences have gotten much broader in their geographic footprint. We could consider more regional competition. Uh, but the year-round nature of sport is something that has, I think, probably changed um, over the years. And, and Jim, you would be a good person to comment on this and others who have been around sport for a longer period of time than I have. But the conditioning and training that goes on year-round, the informal competition that goes on year-round, year is, is quite significant. Uh, and the NCAA recently has allowed coaches to have more access to students over the summer. So football, men's basketball, women's basketball, there are uh, designated opportunities now that didn't exist before for coaches to have contact with student athletes. Uh, so uh, this is, I think, a real problem and something that I know Joy, through the Faculty Athletics Committee, wants to bring some attention to in the coming year is to how do we get a grip on this? Are there ways for students to be more efficient in the time that they do spend, uh, have uh, some of the downtime be used more productively or cut out altogether so that there aren't as many hours of a day devoted to these activities. Um, on the other hand, future professionals want to be ready. Student athletes enjoy this activity. We started out with a discussion, Jim, I think, about what students are passionate about. Uh, the students that work on the Daily Tar Heel probably often spend 40 hours a week on daily Tar Heel related activities. Um, when I was in college, I uh, was in the band and I counted up one semester and all the different band activities that I was involved in and music activities, I spent 21 hours a week on band activities. So people find what they're passionate for and do we want to artificially limit what you can spend your time on? And if we did pose a limit, would those students who are training to go to the Olympics, to be professionals in tennis, uh, who think they might have a professional career in the offing in basketball or football, find ways around the rules to do the training that they felt was necessary to put themselves in the best position uh, for those opportunities. So this is really a conundrum. Um, and then there's the other part of it too. If, they, if we limit them somehow on the time that they can spend on sports, what will they spend that freed up time on? Will it be to study in Davis Library, or will it be in other activities which might be less desirable than time spending on sports? So this is a true conundrum, and when we open it up for questions and comments, I'd be interested in ideas you all might have about how we tackle this issue um, and get our students to uh, spend more time when that's needed on their uh, academic pursuits. You all are creating a lot of pressure for Bubba and Jim now. <laughs> Bubba, as commercial activity in sport has increased, what has been the impact on the collegiate experience for the student? Well, I think the, um, the commercial activity has really caused and accelerated some of our issues. So, you know, I think Lisa, I, everyone here has articulated a lot of different issues that are all happening at the same time. And I don't think there's a singular answer to any of them because they're all interrelated and connected because as, as Lisa indicated, you know, there's the people that want to pursue a, a path to professional athletics. And I think Jim is alluding to um, give them other opportunities, give them other choices. If going to college isn't what you want to do, is there another way for you to get to a professional level? So the whole discussion about academic preparedness really has both elements to it is where do I want to go as, as um, Joy was saying, and is this a path to get me there? You know, maybe college sports may not be the path to get to um, professional sports in football and basketball, or maybe it's not the most efficient way to do it today, so we should think about modifying them. But I think all of those are related. But before I continue on, how many of you in here are former student athletes? Please raise your hand. So quite a, quite a few. So Jim, did you raise your hand? <laughs> 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 There's questions. <My> old mind. <laughs> but, you know, so that's probably roughly about um, I don't know. It's probably about five or six percent of the people in the room, which is basically five or six percent of the student body population at the University of North Carolina. But if you look at the Ivy League model, there's probably thirty percent 
of the students in the Ivies that participate in intercollegiate athletics. And so when Jim talks about the variety of the 351 schools at Division I, there is a lot of difference. But the commercial activity has really created issues that I don't think any of us really anticipated. And it's really been created within the last 30 to 35 years. You know, in 1979, the Big East Conference was formed, and that was particularly formed around basketball and to create a television network or a, a television opportunity for those schools. In 1982, USA Today was published for the first time. Also in 1979, ESPN was created. 1984, Michael Jordan signs his contract with Nike, which is the first time commercial activity really is sponsored by an individual athlete. And so from the late 70s, early 80s, is really what we're trying to deal with is the infusion of money that has been created and what is the best use of that money. You know, of the, all the schools at the NCAA level, we talk about 460,000 student athletes. The schools provide $2.7 billion of financial aid for those kids to go to college and participate. So if the idea is to generate revenue, to create opportunities for people to get an education and go to school, then I think it's terrific. If the commercial activity is simply to build bigger stadiums, better locker rooms, and pay coaches' salaries more, then obviously that's a problem. And I think we've gone past what most people would agree is a good balance in what we're doing, similar to what we've done on the time balance. But unwinding this is really going to be complicated because, as I mentioned, they are all very much interconnected. But there are also so many students that can balance it and they can pursue their academic dreams and aspirations as well as their athletic aspirations. And one thing I do want to mention is the, we talked about the outgoing student body president who had opportunities to go everywhere and chose to come to Carolina because of an athletic program. Our incoming student body president is a current student athlete. And I think it's the first time in the history of the school we've had a current student athlete as a student body president who by virtue of being a student body president is a trustee. Not only was, is this person on our track team, but he's a former professional uh, baseball player. So we have, and he also is a cancer survivor. So other than walking on water, which he hasn't done yet, which I'm a little surprised, and if he did walk on water, I can see the headline right now in the News and Observer. Houston Summers can't swim. So that's a, <laughs> So I think these are they're great issues, and the greatest thing about Carolina is we beat these issues to death because I think at the end of that process, we come out better. And while it can be challenging at times, and it certainly has been for a number of years, if we keep our open mind to what we're trying to do, which is get better each and every day, provide a great experience for these student athletes in the classroom and in the fields of competition, then we're going to be better off for it. And I want to figure out a way for the commercial activity to make it a better place and a better opportunity for those kids to participate. All right, Jim. What working relationship between academic and athletic leaders best serves the interests of the student athletes? Well, I think the most important thing is that there be a working relationship of mutual respect and shared goals between the athletic and the academic part of the university with the overall concern for the welfare of our students. And I think that we're well on the way toward having that. Uh, several of us at this table work together in the student athlete academic working group. Several of us work together in the faculty athletic committee. Certainly Lisa and Bubba work together in a number of different activities as well. So this is not the first time that we've met. We spend an awful lot of time together. And I think from, from my standpoint as the chief academic officer of the university, that we do have a relationship of mutual respect and shared goals. I, I never feel like when I'm talking to Bob or one of his teams that I'm looking for something that's very different uh, from what he's looking for. Uh, I do think that, in addition to what I've already said, that the movement of the academic support program for student athletes, henceforth ASPSA, into the provost's office was an important step in the right direction. Uh, you've heard already uh, plaudits for Dr. Michelle Brown, who leads that organization and is now a direct report of me because it allows me to monitor and to influence the messages that student athletes are receiving about their academic lives from the tutors and the counselors there. And I think that's been really, really helpful. 
Um, just last week, we had one of, actually, it's become overnight sort of one of my favorite events of the year, which is the, I'll never get the name right, but it's the luncheon at which we recognize the academic accomplishments of student athletes, and I think all of us uh, at the table were there. And the, we had several students who had 4.0 averages in one of the two semesters last year. We had several students who were uh, brought into Phi Beta Kappa last year. We had multiple students who were uh, academic All-Americas, whether regionally or nationally. The list goes on. And I think we have that because of the desire at this university to try and exceed in both. And as uh, Bob and I have talked about this many times, if this university isn't able to get it right, I'm not sure who is. Thank you. Okay, while the questions are being brought up, if any of you have questions and don't have cards, if you raise your hand, we'll get you cards. Um, this is for the provost and dean. I guess that would be both you. He was once known as Dean Dean, for those of you who have not. I am a semi-retired academic administrator. Can you help us understand how the academic fraud situation could survive for such an extended period of time? The academic fraud situation? Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I have to admit, when I became fully aware of what happened here, for nearly 20 years, I had exactly the same question. And it's not any one thing, I will say that. Uh, part of it was that it was uh, very concentrated uh, within a small number of people who were making it work, uh, two people in particular with help from a few others. And I will say also, now that I better understand what happened, that those individuals went to great lengths to conceal what was going on because they knew that it was wrong. So a small number of people who did a, an amazing job of concealing something that they knew was an illicit activity and shouldn't have, have happened. And, and then I think, so as not to lay all the blame at the feet of just a couple of people, I do think also that our oversight of that was not what it should have been. That they, uh, our, there were a few processes in particular that should have happened that didn't happen. Uh, if, if you have read all this, and you know, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know, but we didn't have uh, the right kind of performance reviews that we should have had at the time. We didn't have the right kind of auditing of classes that we did at the time. So it was a combination of a small number of clever people hiding an illicit activity and a university that at the time did not have the processes in place to, to catch it. Um, to answer the question that wasn't asked, uh, we've changed all of that. So there have been put in place over the last few years uh, to some degree from the efforts of the people sitting at this table, over 70 changes in what we do around the intersection of academics and athletics. And I'm very confident that nothing like this could happen again. Any of you want to add to that? Yeah, I would, I would just, I've been around more than um, one scandal in my, you know, 35 years as a conference commissioner. And it's always a combination of two things that allow big things to go wrong over a period of time. One is people. Most of your problems and most of your solutions are around you know, making sure that key people in key situations are trustworthy, honorable, and all, um, you know, all rowing in the right direction. But the other is systems, checks and balances. And you need both. You need checks and balances and accountability, and you need good people. And even good people without checks and balances sometimes lose their way. And you really can't have a, a system and an environment with a lot of pressure um, without having very good people, very good culture, and very good checks and balances. I just want to add one more thing to that. Uh, I appreciate what Jim's saying. Just, I mean, when I say 70 reforms, that must seem like, one of, what does that even mean? So let me just tell you about one. So one of the things that might have tipped off that there was a problem going on uh, a few years ago was that we had large concentrations of student athletes in certain courses. So now we have a review process that's led by the registrar that if 
The concentration of student athletes is greater than 20% in any one course. It kicks off a review that's led from within the academic part of the organization. We've had that in place for several years now. But I want to say that we've identified a number of courses that have more than 20% athletes. And we haven't found a single course in which anything is wrong. So the very fact that student athletes happen to congregate in a course is no more evidence that there's something wrong with that course than if there were a concentration of young women from a sorority or music majors. So I just want to make sure we're getting both sides of this out. We've done the reform, but, but you know, don't take anything that you see like this as sort of some sort of <clears throat> prima facie evidence that there's really something wrong, because we've looked at a lot of courses and we have no, not found anything more along these lines. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to look for a volunteer to answer this because it was not directed at any one person. Do you believe the new rules on full cost of attendance are a good move, or do they blur the differences between professional and collegiate athletics? Um, you may not get applauded I, this time. No, I think that, uh, again, they're all, they're all related, they're all connected. Um, you know, Jim was talking, or uh, Lisa and Joy were talking about time commitments, and Jim had talked about uh, freshman eligibility, and we stopped doing it because of money. We also stopped doing laundry money. Um, and so the cost of attendance is a financial aid figure. Up until this point, room, board, books, tuition, and fees was what a full scholarship included. Now it's cost of attendance. So as we have cannibalized time of students, you know, they don't have an opportunity to get jobs. They don't have much time in the summer. So part of this is giving back in some financial way the laundry money, or if you're not allowed to have a summer job, full cost of attendance will help you have meet ends throughout the academic year through cost of attendance. And in our case, it's, it's fairly expensive. You know, if we're going to average about $4,500 a scholarship and we have 300 scholarships, you're looking at slightly over a million dollars for the athletic department to fund for these students. But I also think of that as another million dollars in financial aid for students that are participating in sport. If someone said the University of North Carolina was going to raise a financial aid by a million dollars, we'd all say that's terrific. So again, it goes back to the commercial activity and the opportunity to provide kids the opportunity to get an education and participate in sport. So while, yes, it's very expensive, it is built into the financial aid package, and we should be able to manage that appropriately to give the kids what they need to be successful. I'll chime in. I'll chime in on this also. Um, at, at schools like Carolina, we have a lot of resources. We're in a great conference. Um, what I worry about is other schools that aren't so well resourced and that the impact of the cost of attendance um, could, could have um, the effect of limiting opportunities to compete. So I'm, I'm worried that at some schools at least uh, to fund that for high profile sports, there might be uh, the dropping of other sports. So that's uh, a long term thing that I think we mm. ought to keep our eye on uh, as we go forward. Jim? I think, I think it is the right thing to do. I mean, if you look back and, um, you know, in, into the 60s and early 70s, I think the uh, out-of-state tuition here was probably, I would just be taking a guess, but I bet you it was no more than 2000 or $2,500. And so we, were, we received, you know, $15 a month, 10 times a year, $150. I don't know what that is in today's dollars, but it was meaningful. And so... Uh, Today to go to school here, it's probably what twenty out of state, twenty five or thirty thousand dollars. Thirty five. My wife pays the tuition. My. <laughs> I mean, I pay it, but she knows. In that case, yes, you were right. Yeah. <laughs> but but in any event, it's right to me because it's what it costs to go to college. It's called the cost of education. It's not pay for play. It's room, board, fees, tuition, and a cost of education stipend. And if the money's there to build the stadium and to pay the coach, the money ought to be there for the full scholarship athlete because it's the cost of education. But we have to make sure the education part is actually central and primary to the experience. If it's money that it's not for the education, then what's the point?
So this is going to be the next to last question. I'm going to tell you what the last question is so you can be thinking. If we have not provided you an opportunity to say something that you now wish you'd had the opportunity to say, but the question didn't tease it out, that'll be the last question. This is the next to last question directed toward whomever the eager volunteer is. Given that alumni pressure is strong, how can alumni be persuaded to value academics over athletic success at the institutional level? You fill the stadiums, win or lose. You're sitting there till the end of the game and you're supporting the student athletes. That's what we need you to do. There's more, but, <laughs> but the more we pressure to win, to win, to win, the coaches want to bring in the players who are NCAA eligible but may not be a good fit for Carolina because they want to win. For the alumni, they want to win for everyone sitting in the stadium. The more you do that, the more Bubba has pressure to bring in the coaches who can get the win. You bring in the coaches to get the win by building a nicer stadium. You get the players who have been told since they were in eighth grade they're going to play professional sports and make $5 million. Okay, we lose sight of the goal, which is matching education opportunity, which Bubba speaks all the time about. We lose sight of the education, the opportunity, and we're only looking at the athletics. Okay, do any of you have one last parting thought that you have not had a chance to say? You don't all have to have one. That's okay. Well, I don't know if I missed it in the beginning because I was late. Again, my apologies. You were not as late as you thought you were. We but, started early. <laughs> but I really wanted to, uh, to welcome everybody back. And I think coming back demonstrates <clears throat> your commitment to the university, your commitment to the academic mission. And it's not the athletic mission that any institution is about. And as Jim mentioned, Carolina is one of the very few schools that can do it at the highest level academically and athletically. And when I think about the leaders of the industry, I think about the guy that runs ESPN in John Skipper, the guy that runs the Big Ten in Jim Delaney, the person that runs the ACC in John Swafford. I mean, those are Carolina graduates with incredible core values about how you can have the greatest experience academically and athletically. We're fortunate that they are a part of the alumni group that serve this institution so well. So I'm delighted you're back, and I, I pledge to you that we will hire coaches that want to get students here, that want an education, and I think we've got the support structure in place that allows us to provide that education and to represent the institution the way you'd like it represented. So thank you for having me. Okay, I'm going to, uh, before we thank our panelists, uh, share something that I uh, came across some years ago as part of the Knight Commission. Bart Giamatti was the longtime president of Yale University, went on to become the commissioner of Major League Baseball. And uh, he spoke once at Williams College, and he wrote a, an essay on the state of the college game, and he concludes his essay with this. So we care about athletics in colleges or universities because the selling job worked. Athletic programs of a certain kind are so visible, such surrogates for their institutions, that those programs do get the public's attention. Except now, the athletic programs are communicating failures of nerve and failures of principle and purpose that threaten to engulf the whole institution of higher education in ways unfair and dangerous. What was allowed to become a circus, college sports, threatens to become the means whereby the public believes the whole enterprise is a sideshow. To reform intercollegiate athletics is to begin to approach again a true reexamination of American higher education's nature and purpose. To reform that valuable dimension of an education is to begin to remember that an educational institution teaches far, far more and more profoundly by how it acts than by anything anyone within it ever says. To, perform the, to reform the abuses of athletics would begin to earn again the public's broad-based, deeply rooted faith in collegiate, athletic, collegiate education, without which neither public nor private institutions, neither the large nor the small, can survive or flourish in the ways they must 
if they are to fulfill their mission to serve America and keep her as they themselves should be, civil, cohesive, and free. I hope that you have found over the course of our discussion that uh, athletics at Carolina is in very able hands. And you should leave reassured and comforted by the national leadership we also provide in the form of whether it's John Skipper or John Swafford or Jim Delaney. So please join me in giving a round of applause to our panelists.